right, so here we go with our last story, <laughs> excuse me, of the Age of Invasion. So as if you remember, we talked about the Umayyads, the Abbasids. We had gotten to the point of about 1000 AD, and I said between 1000 and 1300 AD, there was a series of invasions into the Middle East. And of course, they included the Seljuks, uh, then the Crusaders, which of course shifted all the way into Constantinople. Um, and then as we move into about the early 12, early to mid 1200s, you're going to get the invasion from the Mongols. And obviously this is a topic you would cover more in, you know, let's say a history of Asia class. Uh, but even in this class, I do like talking about it because they do have an impact all the way into the Middle East. And again, this is all part of creating that power vacuum in the Middle East, which is gonna open the door for the most significant civilization of Middle Eastern history, the Ottomans. So we're gonna get into that very shortly. So I don't expect this to be a long lecture, but it's always kind of fun. You know, le lecturing on the Mongols is always interesting uh, because of what they accomplish. Everything you see colored on this map indicates land of the Mongol Empire. Uh, so they're going to start up here from what we call the Gobi Desert, Gobi or Gobi Desert, um, and they're going to spread very quickly throughout the, the you know, region you see on this map and into the Middle East. Um, they actually go a little further than even what you see on this map. I'll show you another map at the end. They, they get even larger. Uh, but to give you perspective, this is about four times the size of the Roman Empire. So when you think the Roman Empire is big, you know, the Mongols are about four times the size of that. All right, just give you some perspective. So here's just again a kind of smaller map, um, but also some of the keywords we're associating with the rise of the Mongols. Uh, so here again, you see the Gobi Desert, it's smaller here, but it's kind of up here. And you could see, just to again give you perspective, everything I'm circling here, that's the Roman Empire at its height. So this is why I say it's about four times bigger than the Roman Empire, it's that huge. So in terms of the early history of the Mongols, I really don't go into a lot of detail on them. I mean, we know that the Mongols oh, date back to at least about 1000 BC. Again, they started primarily from the Gobi or Gobi Desert there. Uh, and, you know, they really don't do too much until we get to about 200 BC. They start to get a little bit more aggressive in the area. Uh, this is, of course, what eventually leads to a creation of a little monument we call the Great Wall of China. Uh, and so I'm going to show you a picture of that in a second if you're not familiar with it. Uh, but, you know, it tells you something that that wall was built. You know, it was built in part, there's several reasons, but in part because of the invasions that possibly from the Mongols. Um, and then we kind of jump way ahead to about the year 1150 AD, and that's when we get to the most famous person, and the one we'll actually spend the most time on, talking about a man named Genghis Khan, or sometimes spelled Chinggis Khan, or Genghis Khan, I've heard his name pronounced different ways, uh, but of course he's the most famous guy we associate with the Mongol Empire, for good reason. Uh, this is always interesting, because when I, when I do these lectures normally in a normal semester, uh, and not, not in an online world. In the same week I lecture on Genghis Khan, I'm also lecturing on Alexander the Great in my Western Civ class, early Western Civ, and Napoleon in my modern Western Civ class. So there was one day I remember I was lecturing on Genghis Khan, Napoleon, and Alexander all on the same day. Oh, excuse me, you just sneezed and come out. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so anyway, so you can imagine those three guys together at a dinner party at the same time. That would have been kind of fun. Uh, so <laughs> crazy. So anyways, let's kind of go through what happens during the period of primarily Genghis Khan. Real quick, let me just show you an image of the Great Wall of China if you're not familiar with it. This is just this amazing monument that was built. And again, you know, you don't build walls. Uh, you know, why do you build walls? I always say you build walls to keep people out, right? Unless you're the communist and you build walls to keep people in. Uh, but generally you build walls to keep people out. Uh, and it shows you the, the size of this wall. You know, obviously China was a little bit worried about the various invasions. All right, so let's get into kind of the major part of the story today, which is how the Mongols expanded and conquered so much land. And of course, it's associated with this man again named Genghis Khan. So that's just an image we have of him. And the question is, what is he going to do in terms of expansion? How is he going to achieve this amazing expansion of uh, the, the, the Mongol Empire? 
So here's some key words here. Uh, get all these words down. This is the kind of military and strategies of the Mongols, specifically un under Genghis Khan. You're going to get all the words down. If you get pause, if you need to, because I'm going to go to another scene here in a second. But I'll give you a couple things right off. We do know that when Genghis Khan was born, um, you know, at the age of nine, the, the whole area was divided into a lot of clans. There was no real united Mongol force around the year 1150 AD. Um, and at the age of nine, his father was actually killed by a rival clan. Uh, so that's one thing we know about him. Uh, but eventually Genghis Khan rose up and became a very influential person. Uh, he had conflicts with his own family. At one point, he killed his own brother uh, when his brother was a teenager uh, because he saw his brother as a bit of a threat. And we have some sources on them. One source, I didn't put it up here, but it's called The Secret History of the Mongols. Uh, and it's kind of one of the primary source documents that we have uh, because it, it, it kind of tells a lot of the stories we have of the Mongol Empire and Genghis Khan. So how is he going to do this? So again, get all these little terms down. I'm going to explain these terms as we go through, uh, you know, the, the, the in couple images here and talk about how he expands and grows. All right. So here is, again, this is our cavalry that the, the, the Mongol hordes used. That was one of the words, hordes. Um, and the, uh, there would be 10,000 men in a Mongol horde. And one of the things that Genghis Khan was very smart about doing is, I just said there were a lot of clans, that there was no united area in the region. And if you have a bunch of various clans throughout the area of the region of Mongolia, what Genghis Khan would do when he would recruit his men, he would never recruit one horde of 10,000 men all from the same clan. He instead would draw people from different clans and create one big horde and then bring another group from another from all the different clans and create another big horde. And that was very smart. And why would you do that? Well, you know, one of the reasons you do that is that way you don't have people loyal to a clan. Instead, they're loyal to that, you know, Mongol ruler in the case of Genghis Khan. Now, how big of an army did he create, uh, Genghis Khan? Well, about 130,000 men. And that doesn't sound like it's that big. But to give you perspective, it was apparently about 10 percent of the population of the time, right? About 10 percent of the population of the Mongol Empire. So to give you again an understanding of what that would mean, it would be in the United States. We have a little under 350 million people. It would be 10 percent and be a standing army of 35 million men. Uh, if you know anything about our military, our military is not 35 million men in the United States, right? We have about a million, million and a half, I think, with standing in reserve and everything. So it would be like having a military size 30 times what we have almost, right? 20 to 30 times bigger. So per capita, it is a massive army. Basically, if you were an adult male, you are going to be in the Mongol Empire army. Um, his most famous thing were these cavalrymen the, that they would ride about 270 miles in a three-day period, which was very effective in allowing them to conquer a lot of area very quickly. And they had these bows that you could see on this image here. And what they did, this is very important as well, is they used what is called a composite heavy bow. That was one of the key terms there. Now, if you go to the same time period or around that time period, in the Middle Ages in Western Europe, a lot of times they use bows as well, but they use kind of more long bows. Now, I want you to think of why that would matter. Why is this composite bow so much more useful? Well, it's so much more useful because, A, it's stronger, right? It packs more of a punch. I remember actually watching this on a documentary once on the Mongols where they basically took a brass plate, right? They took a brass plate that was one H, one eighth inch thick, right? Like a one eighth inch thick brass plate. And they shot an arrow through it. Uh, and they tried it with a long bow and they tried it with a composite bow. And what they saw is that the composite heavy bow would uh, would penetrate two inches deeper. So if you're wearing armor, right, the long bow would go in a little bit, the composite bow would go in, pierce the flesh, do a lot more damage. Uh, so that was one thing that was very smart on the part of Genghis Khan. So this packed more of a punch. 
The other thing is, try, look at them. They're riding their horses and firing their arrows, which was in itself amazing. Apparently, they were amazing sharpshooters where they could hit a target, you know, hundreds of feet away and, and while riding a horse. It's absolutely stunning if you think about it. Uh, but you can't do this with a longbow because every time you turn, look how the man is turned here. If you have a longbow, every time you turn, it's going to hit the horsey, right? And the horsies are not going to be happy. Uh, so with a, with a composable, it allows you to use it while you're riding a horse. So this was one key thing. So I'm giving you about, I don't know, I'm going to give you like seven, eight, nine key things that allowed the Mongols to expand militarily. So each one of these things you obviously want to jot down. So number one would be like, you know, recruiting people from different clans into one horde. That would be effective. Number two is using the composite bow. Uh, you know, using the cavalry to fight very effectively. So these are all things that you can kind of list as we're going through. Uh, another important uh, technique that'll help the Mongols uh, conquer land is their arm, uh, their armor. So there was their weapons and there was their armor. Now, when you think of their armor, you know, think of Middle Ages. What do people wear? Chainmail armor, right? Chainmail armor, plate mail armor, all of that stuff you think of in the Middle Ages. Well, this is around the same time. The Mongols didn't do that. It would be very heavy, obviously. Instead, what they used is basically leather armor and this, again, pretty amazing, a silk shirt under the leather armor. What apparently, go? is that going to be very effective? Well, again, if you're mobile or you're not doing sword to hand to hand fighting, that helps. But what if an arrow hits you? Well, apparently, when you have a silk shirt, I don't even understand the physics of this at all. But if an arrow comes at you, it goes through the leather armor, but then you're wearing a thin silk shirt, somehow the silk shirt wraps itself around the arrow. And again, I never knew this. I, had to, I, I saw this. I, I read it. Then I looked it up and I saw a video and it kind of gets in there and it wraps it up really quick. And that prevents penetration into the skin. And something as simple as leather armor with a silk shirt underneath apparently helps stop the damage. So they had a strong weaponry, but they also had strong um, uh, defense. All right, next we move on. Some other points about how Genghis Khan was so successful. Uh, there was a psychological element, a strategic element of fighting that was important as well. So you want to note this down. So he was a very good tactician. For example, one time he was at a war with another one of his brothers, um, and he was outnumbered. He was a battle. He was completely outnumbered. The night before the battle, he's ridiculously outnumbered. What does Genghis Khan do? Well, he knows he's outnumbered. He's still a good distance away from his men, from his opponent. And what Genghis Khan did is he had each of his men light five fires at night, right? Five kind of campfires. So one man would light, light five campfires, right? One man, but five campfires. His opponents are sitting there at night and they see all these campfires and they're going, oh boy, Genghis Khan had all these men there. Let's not take him on. And he avoided a battle when he wasn't ready for it. That was very smart. So using clever tact uh, tactics like that. Another tactic that was very useful for Genghis Khan was the pretending to retreat one, where he would make, he would convince his enemy that he's retreating when he's really not. He's encircling them. His enemies would come in un kind of unaware and with their guard down a bit because they think, hey, he's escaping. And then, you know, the cavalry would encircle them and capture them. Actually, somebody who learned from this was Napoleon. Napoleon studied some of this and used some of these same techniques. So that was something that was effective as well. All right, so it's the strategies as well. The psychology of it, one of the things Genghis Khan would do, a couple things under psychology that helped uh, him conquer land is he had these big drums that I mentioned at the end of the previous lecture, and you could hear these uh, drums and they would pound away and, and you know, people would know that this is the, the, the Mongols coming in after you. And, you know, the story goes that Genghis Khan would actually send some of his men as spies ahead of his conquest to various areas. And he would say, you know, he would disguise them as just merchants. 
and these merchants would enter a city and then they would tell stories about how vicious and brutal the Mongols were and it would spread and then when you hear the drums you all you remember are those vicious you know stories of this how horrible and then uh oh the Mongols are coming don't fight them just do what they want because if you do you know they're gonna destroy you and you know they're gonna loot and burn and destroy and all that stuff and you know you bring in that fear um, in that way and that was part of it you create that fear psychologically uh, another psychological fear he would do is he would capture enemies from one city, kill them, take the dead bodies to the next city, and if there was like a moat or something in a city, he would then take the dead bodies, put them in the moat, um, and then walk over them. And that was, again, as a sign to the people in the other city, um, yeah, don't mess with us, basically listen to us and do what we want to do. Uh, so these were kind of the psychological elements that he used to, to fight effectively also. Uh, another story is the story of the Tanguts. The uh, Tanguts were a group of people in northern China. And so around the year 1209, he made a deal with them. And he said, okay, I'm going to leave your city alone. I'm not going to ravage it. Uh, but if I need your men, you need to, they all have to volunteer. So 10 years later, in the year 1219, he goes to the same area in northern China, tells the Tangos, you know, we need your men. They said, no, we don't want to fight for you. At which point, he wiped out everybody, the women, the children, everyone. So Genghis Khan is up there with one of the more brutal leaders in history, right? This was not a nice guy. You know, very often he's kind of seen as this great conqueror, and he was. Uh, but in terms of a person, he was not a really good person at all. So here he is. These are all the things Genghis Khan has done to help him succeed. So then there's one more I'm going to show you in a second, but let me just go through them again. Make sure you got them all down. Uh, so it's the cavalry. That was very effective, right, on uh, how far they could ride and move. Uh, it was the composite bow. It was the uh, leather armor and the silk underneath it. That was very effective. It was the uh, strategies that he used and I gave you a couple of examples of that it was the psychology that he used gave you a couple of examples of that um, and of course he's going to use one other really really cool device that's going to help as well um, and what is this other cool device so let me show you too okay and so what is this amazing device what is that Eve? Watch it. what is it what do you want to watch? What is it? Can you say trebuchet? I want the trebuchet. You want to watch the trebuchet? Okay. Yeah, do you like the trebuchet? I want the trebuchet. What does the trebuchet throw? Does it throw cars? Yeah. Yeah, we want to watch the trebuchet throw cars? I want the trebuchet. Okay, I'll show you the trebuchet. Mama will show you the trebuchet and you can play match. Okay, say bye. 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 No, 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 trebuchet. Yeah, Mama's going to show you trebuchet. Yeah, trebuchet. So even my two-year-old knows that this is a trebuchet. So what is this device? Well, this was something that the Mongols used as well as they conquered various cities. Um, and what they would do is they would put these kind of fire bombs in this device, and it would launch... Um, uh, these these bombs that would launch, you know, very far distances, kind of this in a kind of gooey, liquidy um, clay. It would be a clay pot. It would be kind of liquidy, gooey, liquidy things that would set a fire, hit a city, and burn it. Um, and so this was very effective. And yeah, there are images of people launching like cars and stuff with trebuchets. Um, and so I'm gonna try to find a couple and maybe post those as well for you. Uh, so anyway, so that's the trebuchet, and they use that as well. Okay. All right. And so this is kind of our last image here of the Mongols. And what we're seeing here is just our map, again, of where they expanded to. And so using all these techniques, then the Mongols were very effective, and they conquered all of this area. And you can see on this map a little clearer now what I mean by they're moving into parts of the Middle East, right? Uh, here's like Baghdad, right? And parts of the Byzantine Empire even. Um, and so all of this is what's part of that age of invasion. And this is what's going to kind of leave the entire area vulnerable around 1300 AD for the rise of the, the um, Ottomans.
One other quick little story about Genghis Khan uh, that I just want to share with you. Uh, this is just kind of an interesting, a colleague of mine gave me this, but apparently Genghis Khan was a prolific lover, DNA data implies, just if you're curious, this is kind of crazy. So an international group of genetics studying Y chromosomes, uh, chromosome data found that nearly 8% of the men living in the region of former Mongol Empire carry Y chromosomes that are nearly identical. That translates to 0.5% of the male population in the world, or 16 million descendants living today. Khan's eldest son, Tushi, is reported to have had 40 sons. Uh, documents written during just after Khan's reign says that after conquest, looting, pillage, and rape were the spoils of war for all soldiers, but that Khan's got first pick of beautiful women. His grandson, Kublai Khan, had established the Yuan dynasty in China, had 22 legitimate sons, and he was reported to have added 30 virgins to his harem each year. So anyways, there are a lot of people apparently historically are related to Genghis Khan. So that's just a quick little side story that I always like to share as well. Uh, we don't know where Genghis Khan is even buried. There are these stories that when he was buried, he was taken to a place, and then the people who buried him were killed, and those people, um, so nobody knows where he's buried, so all these kind of crazy stories. Uh, but at the end of the day, in a short time, he conquered this massive area. It doesn't hold when he dies. It all kind of falls apart. And again, that's important because when it does fall apart for our course, where it's important is in the Middle East. Because by now, the Byzantine Empire is weak, the Umayyads, the Abbasids are gone, the Seljuks are weak, and it opens again the door for the Ottomans. There is one other lecture we're going to do before that, however, because before we get to the Ottomans, there's some really interesting stuff happening in India. Uh, because when we think of India today, we think of it as a Hindu nation, uh, but actually much of the history of India had a lot of strong Islamic influence in there. And there was a very interesting dynasty called the Mughal dynasty uh, that's going to dominate India. So we're just going to do one brief lecture on, on India, uh, talk about that a little bit, because we're going to kind of carry that all the way to modern times. Um, and then we'll kind of backtrack to 1300 again and hit the Ottomans over several lectures. All right, so I hope all that's clear. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found all that stuff uh, Genghis Khan did pretty cool and the trebuchet and uh, all pretty neat stuff. All right, uh, that's it. Have a good day. Let me know if you have any questions.